I was living here in DC Chevy Chase on Morrison Street. And uh, Vera lived a block away. And she and her husband were incredibly hospitable. At the time, we had a one-year-old. And she had us over for dinner a number of times. Um, you know, we were dealing with the challenges of one-year-olds waking up at night and going on. Uh, and I remember very well mentioning to her um, the kid passing some milestone. This was a while ago, since the one-year-old is now a graduate student, um, and had slept through the night. And Vera, who had four, said, yeah, the milestones continue. My youngest just got tenure. <laughs> and now that the one-year-old's a graduate student, and we got together and talked about career paths and things over lunch last week, I realized, you know, there's still some milestones for the children ahead, even if they do all sleep through the night. And Vera, uh, you know, uh, I think of her as a great and good person. Great because what she did for science, but good because she treated everyone around her well. And it was just always a pleasure to be around and was very supportive of, you know, of young people. And uh, I think she's someone we all can continue to learn from in so many different ways. So I, you know, we got invited to, uh, to talk about, talk here, I wanted to think about um, how, giving a talk that tried to explain something that I felt for a while, which is the microwave background observations we have represent a very strong argument for non-baryonic dark matter. And the observations pretty much rule out most alternative gravity theories. And you know, it's one of the reasons why you know, I continue to not understand why people talk about theories like MON today when we have, as you'll see, evidence from the microwave background that shows that there must be something very much like cold dark matter. Um, it doesn't constrain things to the level where we can tell whether it's fuzzy or warm. But there must be a non-baryonic component there. And I think one of the clearest ways to see that, as I'll discuss in my talk, is through the observations of microwave background polarization. And this is work uh, largely done with Chris Pardo. Chris is a graduate student at Princeton who's finishing this year. And he's been exploring um, alternative gravity theories. And we've been looking at various constraints on them. So I want to begin by just reminding you about the dynamics of microwave background fluctuations. And then I want to talk about how, when we look at the CMB polarization, we are directly tracing the velocity fields at the surface of last scatter. We, see ex we can see what velocities look like at redshift of 1100. When we look at galaxies at redshift 0.3, the continuity equation tells us up to a constant factor what the velocities look like at redshift 0.3. And from that, I can compute the Green's function. I know I have to get from redshift 1100 to redshift 0.3. And if I do that with an alternative gravity theory, as you'll see, the behavior of that theory has to be really strange. Because it has to erase acoustic peaks on one scale somehow duplicate the effects of the dark matter, baryons falling into the dark matter. And um, there's no theory we have that looks anything like that. So uh, this is basically the program. And I like to think of it as, uh, I hope, as a, a little a bit of a tribute to Vera, because at the end, we're using velocity fields to learn about dark matter, albeit velocity fields at redshift of 1100. So let's uh, remind ourselves what happens with density fluctuations in the early universe. If I have a region that's overdense, I'll create a region with excess pressure. It sets off a sound wave. And that sound wave propagates out. If there were just baryons and photons, they're tightly coupled, that sound wave would propagate out, move out the sound horizon distance, about a redshift of 1100, the electrons and photons combine to make hydrogen, 
At that point, the universe becomes transparent. And the primary thing we see writ on the microwave sky is the pattern of these sound waves. So the sound waves start, they propagate out, and what you see here are the baryons and photons. The photons can diffuse eventually relative to the baryons as recombination proceeds. And then the effects of dark matter start to kick in, and the dark matter, which was cold, which stayed in where, in that, where that initial fluctuation were, serves as a potential well, and the baryons fall into the potential well, and the fluctuations evolve. And when we get to low redshift, we're left with the baryons primarily falling into the dark matter potential well, and a little bump that uh, is due to the baryon acoustic fluctuations. If we didn't have dark matter, we wouldn't have this piece here. It wouldn't have fallen into the potential well. We just have the peak due to the sound wave. Any alternative gravity theory, if it's going to not have dark matter, is going to have to mimic the effect of that dark matter. It's going to have to create a potential. Well, the baryons are out here. The effects of the dark matter are here. This is actually much more dramatic than the bullet cluster, because you have a separation of in co-moving coordinates of, of order 100 megaparsecs between where the sound waves are and where the dark matter needs to be. And you have, can't have interactions between dark matter and baryons, or you're constrained in the strength of those interactions, or between dark matter and photons. Otherwise, they would have been dragged along in those sound waves. Now what we're going to do is look at what this implies in the microwave background. In the description I'm going to talk about of what's going on in the microwave background to get a more intuitive understanding, we're going to treat the microwave background as an infinitely thin sheet and you make the, uh, that approximation. It's not a terrible one on large scales because um, recombination does happen quite quickly. And when we do that and we look at CMB polarization, we can directly relate the polarization pattern we see in the microwave sky, the pattern of Q and U, it's to gradients in the velocity field. So the polarization pattern is equal to a constant times the thickness of the surface of last scatter. Um, by the way, this is why you can look at the ratio of polarization to temperature and infer the duration of, the sur of uh, recombination quite accurately. So from the Planck results, you can actually measure this to better than about uh, half a percent times the component of the velocity field projected onto the sky. And the way I think about that is if I'm the last electron at the surface of last scatter, photons coming in, if, there's a, if the matter is moving towards me, then the photons coming in are hotter so there's more photons coming in this way, and they scatter to you with that polarization. So polarization is really just proportional to the velocity, or the gradient in the velocity. So, and this doesn't, and this physics doesn't really assume anything about the theory of gravity, right? This is just Thomson scattering, and the fact that Thomson scattering scatters the quadrupole and the polarization into velocity. So that means when you look at the microwave sky and at the pattern of polarization and E-modes, the E-mode polarization pattern is directly proportional to the velocity field. And the polarization maps, that's a Planck one, um, continue to improve. This is the uh, recent results we have from the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. Let's see if I can do this right. Oh, maybe not. I'll skip. I didn't pull that up properly. I was going to do a transition from uh, Planck to ACT, but these are higher resolution maps. And our polarization maps are going to continue to improve. This shows what we hope to achieve with the 
the Simons Observatory. This shows the current measurements from Planck on temperature, polarization. See, Planck has, a, has very good polarization maps up to about L of 1,000. And from the Atacama, we're planning to push out to several thousand. So the polarization measurements I'll talk about are only going to get better. One very nice way to think about the polarization pattern, and this is a, an I, a, approach that was first developed by Chiro Kumatsu, and uh, now uh, this, this result, well, these results here are results from the Planck team, is to take the hot and cold spots you see in the microwave sky and stack them. And first in temperature, you can see around each cold spot is a hot ring, and around each hot spot is a cold ring. So in temperature, you can directly see, and these are just stack maps. We stack up all the fluctuations, and the, what below is the theory prediction compared to it. This is the pattern we saw from that sound wave. The sound wave moves out, you have a hot ring, and there's the dark matter. Right? The dark matter is creating a potential well that's affecting the baryons. And if the dark matter uh, was interacting with the baryons, if it, was, if it wasn't non-baryonic, it wouldn't sit, just sit there. And if you have some alternative gravity theory, it's going to have to take the excess here and explain in the cold spots, or well, here the hot spot or the cold spot there. What are you doing? Hmm. Oh, good. And here's the pattern of polarization. And what you see here is the velocity field. And we'll look at that more closely next. So here's the pattern of polarization around, I think this is around a cold spot. And you can see the polarization changing sign as the velocity field changes sign. And we can go from the measured polarization and here we've chosen the orientation of Q, so Q is the radial component around the spots. I can just integrate this up and get the velocity field. So that's what we did, and this is the velocity field around the typical cold spot. You just integrate it up, and you can see the sound wave moving out. But you could also see two other very interesting signatures. One is this Actually, I got to change this. I flipped the sign. This is actually, contra this is moving in. This is contraction. I switched from hot spot to cold spot. This is contraction due to the dark matter minimum. And uh, so here, this response is due to the dark matter sitting there. And you're seeing them fall into the dark matter in the polarization. What's nice also to note um, is when you get to sc sales, scales beyond the sonic horizon, so this is where, as far as causality can act, you still see stuff falling inward. Why is that? That's because there's super horizon fluctuations. This piece here tells us that either we need a theory like inflation that has a period of uh, expansion that's so rapid, that's superluminal, that it can generate fluctuations on large scales, or we need some mechanism for generating fluctuations back at the initial singularity. So something like a, a, a bouncing model, something like the kind of theories that Steinhardt and others develop with ekpyrotic models, you, you need some way of producing superhorizon fluctuations. And what's very clear from the temperature polarization correlation is there must be primordial superhorizon fluctuations, and we, we see this in the velocity field. I note that while it looks like the theories off the data, these points are all highly correlated. Remember, we integrated up polarization to get the velocity field. So the fact that the polarization tells us about the velocity field means we can take the polarization power spectrum, and this is the measured EE power spectrum from Planck. This is, by the way, the deviation from theory. And this is the 2015 data, so there's still some corrections that they need to make to the polarization due to temperature polarization leakage. 
which is at a pretty modest level compared to the level of the signal. And this is something actually that's the improvement, by the way, that's most significant between the 2015 and uh, 2018, or I guess now 2019, uh, Planck papers. And we can take the, uh, the power spectrum and convert that directly to what is the power spectrum of baryons at redshift of 1,100. And that's shown here in the blue. And then we can compare. That has to translate directly into the galaxy power spectrum um, at redshift 0.3. So we can take that. And that ratio gives us the transfer function. And that's what your theory of gravity must do in terms of a transfer function as a function of k. It has to erase the very strong acoustic fluctuations, because if it's a baryons only universe, there's order unity baryon fluctuations. And while I know that we've seen beautiful BAO fluctuations in Sloan and other surveys, their amplitudes are about a sixth of what they would be um, if we had a universe just of baryons. And that ratio of a sixth is due to, in the standard theory, the fact that baryons make up only a sixth of the matter density. And you can see this very strange K dependence. And that's because you have to mimic the effects of the baryons falling into the dark matter potential. And this looks nothing like Mond or Tevis or any other theory, which is why those theories can't fit the CMB. And you know, there, some clever people have tried various things, but they, te they are unable to fit CMB in large scale structure. And you can see from the polarization data you know, why this is doomed to fail. You could also get good constraints, not just on this Green's function, but on the relationship between potential and temperature uh, fluctuations at redshift of 1,100 by looking at the observed TE correlations, which will let you constrain um, the slip, any modifications of the relationship between potential and density. So you know, dark matter does a particular, you know, the fact that lambda CDM does so well in fitting the CMB tells you that whatever is there has to behave a lot like CDM and it basically is very problematic for any alternative gravity theory. Um, another constraint for many alternative gravity theories that's important to keep in mind also is uh, LIGO's detection of a simultaneous signal from uh, the merger of two neutron stars where you see an electromagnetic signal and a gravitational wave signal. And that means any gravitational wave has to propagate it very close to C. And if you think about how you modify gravity, you're basically modifying the behavior of either, either gravitational waves at large scales or potentials at large scales. And this tells you that the potentials at large scales have to do very strange things. And LIGO tells you that the gravitational waves have to behave as standard GR. So I think we now have some very good constraints um, on the behavior of gravity on large scales. And you know, this just reinforces the, the dark matter. And we have, um, there's been a whole slew of papers over the past couple decades where people use the microwave background to constrain lots of the properties of dark matter. And all of these things point to uh, dark matter being non-baryonic. So this is the, what I want you to take away from the talk, that dark matter has this very distinctive signature in the microwave sky. You have these dark matter potentials that the baryons respond to. And if it wasn't there, you would just have the sound waves. We can see the velocity field of the sound waves directly in the polarization field. And you can think of any CMB polarization map you've seen in E modes really as a map of the large scale velocity fields. And uh, any alternative theory is going to have to mimic the effects of dark matter. And this is going to be very convoluted. And I think all the alternatives that are out there that people have proposed, uh, emergent gravity or MOND, um, all fail to come anywhere near this. And it's going to be a very demanding thing 
for any alternative theory to, to succeed. So uh, I'm, I'm actually going to make up a little time since uh, uh, Ranya just signaled and uh, leave some time for questions. Let me stop here. Thank you very much, David. Questions? I have a question to start with. Um, uh, if you go back to the plot where you showed the data versus um, the stacked mod, what are the blue dots? Oh, no, the next one. This one? Ah, the blue dots are, so we took, the black dots are binned over bins of this width, and it looks as if the points are a little bit more off than they are. So the blue points were just binning up the, the blue curve. So we, we, haven't con we didn't convolve the signal with the bin. Um, these, were, these plots are very uh, fresh. So they were emailed to me late last night to, re okay. to replace <laughs> some of the plots. All right. More questions? Chuck. You mentioned right at the end about emergent gravity Well, it doesn't, uh, it, the way emergent gravity in which, um, it's a theory in which you have um, dark energy and baryons, but no dark matter. And the dark energy r responds to the baryons. So it, uh, in that theory, um, like a lot of alternative gravity theories, what you do is you've designed something where you say, if the galaxy is here, so the baryon's here, my gravitational potential um, doesn't fall off as 1 over r, but falls off, falls off more slowly. That's the feature of MOND or, or modified gravity or many of these alternative theories, is you want to make gravity fall off more slowly from, from a potential well. And the challenge, the problem for all those theories posed by the CMB is we're looking at sound waves. So then you've got the baryons in a shell out here, and you want to create potential fluctuations in the center. So that if you, most of the, the way those things are constructed, they tend to be spherically symmetric, so things like Birkhoff's theorem are applicable often. And it means that in the center you have no effect where you need to have a big effect. So uh, the um, emergent gravity just doesn't have the right kind of mathematical structure to explain why you would have dark matter at places different from the baryons. So I think this is one of the nice tests that people have done with the bullet cluster where you can see there's dark matter where there isn't baryons. And I think that's, that's been apparent to people that that's an important constraint on dark matter. What I hope to convince you of here is that we think, could think of the CMB giving even stronger constraints. Because we can see where the baryons are from the polarization field. And we could see where the temperature fluctuations are, um, which are very sensitive to the potential of the dark matter. And the velocity field and the potential fluctuations are different. So that shows us that we need something different at redshift of 1100. And as a tried to argue well, we can compare things to redshift of 0.3 when we look at things like the Sloan survey. And structure has to grow from then to now in ways that look very different from what you would expect in a theory where you modify 1 over r uh, potentials. And you need to have dark matter acting where there's no baryons. What about carbon reach? Carver, I, I'm not familiar with it, but it, I, I think you can take any theory and ask, does it have the properties of producing forces far away from where you have all the matter, all the baryons? And you can ask, does it, you know, does it have a response where structure would grow in the theory with this dependence on scale? And of course, you can take this and convert this, and this is in case space, you could uh, write this in real space and write what would form the potential has. And it, it doesn't, it's different from any theory I know, but I don't know, don't know that one in particular. 
thought of the public that their software was set up for the polarization measurements to use both general relativity and heat theory. And the, the, the first response, of course, was that general relativity works and heat doesn't. But there's been some noise after that in the whole story. Yeah, I mean, I'm, from everything I've read in the LIGO papers, it's been a remarkable success of general relativity. Okay, let's have one more question. Have you given thought to constraints on uh, the dark matter, its properties constrained by these considerations? Um, yes, I've, we've given some thought. We haven't really gone, you know. <laughs> um, and, but there's actually a, a significant literature where people have looked at constraints on dark, uh, dark matter baryon, dark matter neutrino, dark matter, dark energy interactions. I was even asked by Congress two weeks ago about this. I testified before the House Science Committee, and one of the members came up to me afterwards and says, you have dark matter and dark energy. Could they interact? <laughs> and I thought, I said, this is great. This is what we do as theorists. We try to come ask exactly these questions, and here's what we know about it. Um, Sandra. I think I understand what I believe I understand what you are saying. This plot is in the case of GR, and you are saying that in an alternative theory it would be different. But are you showing? Uh, uh, did you compute what would be in that particular theory? This is not so much assuming GR, but linear growth of fluctuations from redshift of 1100 to redshift of 0.3. So this is, we know what the power spectrum is of the velocities at redshift of 1100. That's from the polarization field. It's just linearly proportional. We know what the, po the power spectrum of the velocity fluctuations are at redshift 0.3. That's from the Sloan data together with the continuity equation. Now, there's a constant that depends on how structure grows and that um, allows you to adjust this transfer function up and down, that's a prediction. But anything in which you have linear growth of density fluctuations from the microwave background, time, to today, has to have this transfer function. Now, standard cold dark matter theory does. And any alternative gravity theory that's going to fit the CMB and fit large scale structure is going to have to have that transfer function. Now, it could be an, a theory that couples K modes. then. Um, the integral over k is going to have to have that form. But this, you can think of this, um, <laughs> though, as I said, this is the uh, work in progress. We have, you know, we're, we're putting this together now, so we haven't put error bars on this plot. But it's really the ratio of the Sloan power spectrum to the, C, to the EE power spectrum measured from Planck. Okay, um, let's end there. Thank you very much.